heavy loads, moving on a cushion of air. One of the questions we get most often, how does it work? An air bearing is a pneumatic device that forms a lubricating film of air between the load and floor surface, similar to that of a hovercraft or an air hockey table. A flexible, wear-resistant urethane diaphragm is inflated by compressed air, forming a seal with the floor and lifting the structure off its rest pads. Air is then squeezed between the floor and the diaphragm, creating a thin film of air and allowing the load to float. The result is a nearly frictionless platform of air which can move large objects without the dangers of forklifts or overhead cranes. Besides the safety advantages, there are several more reasons that AirFloat air bearings are the practical alternative. First, they're nearly friction-free. When floating on air bearings, a thousand pound load can be pushed with just one pound of force. Air float equipment is omnidirectional. Complex movement patterns combining rotation, sideways and lengthwise movements are easy, even with heavy, bulky loads. Because an air bearing has no moving parts, maintenance is minimal and the tray mounting feature allows the air bearing to be removed without lifting the load. Because of the large load lifting area, air bearings won't damage a good floor. The airflow is distributed over a large area, resulting in less point loading. Hello, my name is Jason Stecker and I'm the owner of Align Production Systems and we're here today to talk about our historic brand division, Airfloat and Aircaster Technology. In the late 1950s, General Motors uh, uh, engineers were at a uh, trade show and they were trying to determine how to move cars in and out of the arena without starting the engines. Uh, as they were tearing down the booth, they had a large marketing billboard that fell over and when it hit the ground, it floated across the surface. And this was the original idea for air film technology. Immediately preceding the show, they went back to their laboratories and with Dave Snow and Boss, who ended up being the founder of Airfloat, they developed the first air caster at the General Motor Laboratories and the first patent and air caster ever made was called the GM bearing. A few months after leaving General Motors, Dave Snow and Boss bought the rights to the GM bearing and thus Airfloat was founded in Decatur, Illinois as the original air caster company. I'm here in the air caster uh, manufacturing department with Jason Bublitz. Jason's been making air casters for us for how many years? Eight years. Eight years now. Uh, this is definitely not a high production run automated type manufacturing. It's definitely more of a craftsman uh, type manufacturing where we actually take our laser cut backs. We actually have roll forming machines where we manufacture them here. We have press machines and we actually have a thermal forming machine that we're going to show you next. What you have in front of Jason and I here is a 54 by 78 racetrack bearing. It's one of the larger air bearings we make. Uh, this particular unit uh, is going to get thermoformed in just a minute. Uh, inside the oven, we have a large sheet of urethane heating up right now. And in a few minutes, Jason is going to bring that unit out. And through a vacuum forming process, we're going to form that and allow that material to cool on this buck, which gives it the proper shape to allow for maximum flotation. Now the key to air caster technology is not just in the design of the plenum, but it has to do with the actual construction. Material choices, design, and construction uh, are all critical to longevity. Uh, spare parts can be a real demanding issue for customers if they're tearing air bearings all the time. It gives us a bad name in the industry. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's not good for our press. It's not good for our customers' performance. Um, and so we are very adamant about our design and our technology for this purpose. Uh, Airflow being the original inventor of it, we had an advantage where the original patents uh, protected our uh, design, which really is what we call a half plenum design, uh, where it's roll formed with a half plenum. Uh, the roll forming is critical on this edge because what that allows us to do is as we're going across surfaces, we can actually use our air caster as a brake by simply cutting the air our unit will not roll under. Um, now, that doesn't mean that our air caster doesn't ever tear. If you get a nail or a staple or a rivet stuck in a crack and you run over it, of course it will slice the face of the bearing. But generally speaking, our air bearings don't tear for our customers, but they're able to move freely and as they hit a uh, disruption of air film, they're able to handle it without ripping the bearing off the face. However, our competitor's air caster uh, is a little bit different situation. Uh, this is what is called a Taurus style bearing. Uh, this is the other kind, common type of air bearing. Uh, there is some advantage to it. It's a little bit higher lift. Uh, it can actually float in 
uh, half inflated and then use it as a secondary lift itself to lift something off the ground. Um, however, we don't like the high lift because you also can get a foot underneath it and it's a safety uh, issue for, for operators. Uh, I'm gonna inflate one of these to show you what a torus bearing looks like. A Little bit different, it's more of what's called an inner tube style or a full round plenum. It's an example of what you see there. Now, the negative with this torus style bearing is as it's moving across the floor and you attempt to use it as a brake, because of their construction, it's not roll formed edge, it is actually an adhered to surface. And so what happens is when you try to stop with one of these, it literally rips your air bearing or air caster right off the face of the plate, and then you have to pay to have this replaced. The other disadvantage of the Taurus style bearing is if you notice, we have two of them here. One of them is a black surface and one of them has a yellow surface on it. We, in our air caster construction, we start with a smooth, uh, solid urethane material that we thermoform. This is a actual uh, nylon reinforced uh, membrane that they actually vulcanize to handle the pressure. And the reason they need the nylon in it is to keep this from blowing apart. The negative with the nylon though is as you uh, inflate this and you're under pressure, the fibers of the nylon press through the face and actually create air film disruption and wear. And as you begin to use this and wear on the face of it, it will tear the air bearing because the nylon threading will wear through. So in an attempt to, to deal with that, what you'll see is this yellow urethane, like our urethane, but applied in a liquid form over the surface in an attempt to stop that from happening. But even that begins to wear off, the nylon begins to protrude and eventually wear out. And this is why they sell tons of spare parts and why customers are frustrated with this technology. So again, our design is made, it begins with this uh, urethane solid piece construction does not have not any nylon reinforcing in it. And because of our plenum design, we have the durability and we can use it as a brake without it tearing under and having this type of an effect that occurs when you use it as a brake. What we have here is our standard uh, air caster uh, rigging control handle. Uh, it's a unit that you can pick up and carry around by hand. Uh, it has flow control valves for each of the air casters. It has a pressure regulator and it has an incoming ball valve uh, that you can uh, use to turn air on and off to the system. Once the system is energized with air, generally recommend you running it about 80 PSI into your system, even though the air caster only uses about 35, 36 PSI. Um, the unit, as you can see, as we turn the flow control up, you can tell that this air bearing begins to inflate, and if you can hear it, it's leaking air through the communication holes. This is the experience it'll have in the floor condition uh, and begin to raise this unit off the ground. These are the rest pads. These happen to be lined with UHMW just to protect our nice epoxy floor here uh, in our showroom. Uh, but generally the rest pad is just steel and the load rests steel on concrete. I'm gonna turn this off. I'm gonna put it in its down condition. And as you can see, the steel is resting on the epoxy surface and the load is actually resting not on the air bearing or air caster, but actually on the, uh, the steel surface here. As I begin to put air to this unit, you'll see it'll begin to inflate and come up off the ground. Now, this is why we use air casters in a system of at least three, generally four, as you can see, because the load is not centered, I'm actually tipping at an angle here. But if I had it in a system of three with a load on it, it would begin to level it out, and we'll show you that in a minute. The other thing that you're gonna experience with air casters is what's called hop. Hop is a real problem that exists with air caster technology. What hop is, is a condition where you have too light of a load relative to too much air pressure coming in. And as you begin to dial the air down, you can see that I begin to minimize hop. We also design into all of our systems hop tubes that actually are an anti-air uh, dampening device, an anti-hop device to begin to dampen the air out. And now that I've gotten rid of the air, you can see I have near frictionless movement on this air caster against the ground with my rest pads up off the ground. The nice thing about our air caster technology, only lifting the height that lifts off the ground, is we don't have a situation where a toe can get underneath it to get crushed as this begins to deflate. Because as a unit loses air, this unit will actually deflate and rest back on the ground.
So in addition to the construction of the air uh, caster itself with the rolled edge, the steel back, the right material, it's also critical when we think about the application uh, about the air skid itself. So the first thing about the air skid, again, is the resting pad is resting steel on concrete, not on the air caster itself, but rather on the steel frame. And why that matters in particular is it has to do with how we change the bearing out. So let's pretend that we do end up getting uh, a cut in our air bearing, as we call it a flat tire, and I've got 100,000 pounds sitting on this thing. How am I gonna get that load off to get this out of there in order to change out this, this uh, air caster? Well, there's, there's two ways that we make this happen. Number one, again, because it's resting on the steel edge, we basically have two bolts in the front and you simply undo these two bolts. And because there's no load actually resting on the air caster, you're simply able to reach in and slide the unit out on what we call the slide out tray. And then to change the air caster out, there's a center bolt. All you do is simply take out the center bolt Remove the air caster plenum, uh, get your new one, bring it back in. Retighten the unit and prepare to slide it in the tray. But if you notice, when I took this out, I didn't have to unhook any plumbing. And that's because of our other invention, which is this unit right here, which we uh, call an inlet seal. An inlet seal is something that we make here at our factory. We thermoform this diaphragm, and when you slide the unit in, it forms a plumbingless connection, so when the air is uh, applied to the unit, this plenum actually inflates, creating its own air seal, which allows the air then to flow through the unit and out of the plenum. So to replace this, you simply just put the tray down without removing the load and slide it back in, lining up your uh, two holes here with the bolts in and simply re-bolt the unit to the air skid. We like to joke with our customers, it's gonna take you longer to find where your spare part is in your factory than it does to change out one of these units if you, indeed you got a flat tire along the way. So simply re-secure this. And there you go. You've now completely replaced this uh, plenum in just a, a matter of minutes and you're back up and running without having to take the load off. One of the major considerations uh, about air caster technology and use uh, in factory settings is the flooring conditions. Uh, while we'd love for all of our customers to have a beautiful epoxy floor like the one you see here, it's not very realistic. Uh, while our air bearings love to float on epoxy, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, most of our customers are realistically using this on machine trial finished concrete and all of our air bearing ratings are designed for that purpose. This is a more common machine trial finished surface that you'll find in our industrial customer base. Be careful about competitors of ours giving you ratings for air casters that are all based on beautiful perfect epoxy floors because it's simply not realistic in the world we work in. Also be careful of customers who are not willing to meet our floor specification for an air caster application. This is an example of a floor that would not comply with our air caster technology for proper use. As you can see, this floor is an aged concrete floor that has large cracks in it, abrasion, steps, porousness, and it's very rough and textured. Next, we're gonna talk about air caster technology as it's primarily used in our air skid applications. Uh, one of the misconceptions is that the load uh, is generally resting on the air caster, which is smashed against the ground, and that's not true. What actually happens is the load is actually resting on the steel frame on what we refer to as rest pads, which is this area of the, the skid unit, which is transferring the load directly to the ground. One of the great things about doing this is uh, using air casters over wheels is when you're in a deflated condition, you have no safety issues with your load accidentally moving away. It's literally resting steel on concrete. Now, once it's in this position, uh, as you can see, the air caster is actually elevated above the ground, and so the question becomes, how does an air caster begin to perform? Well, the first thing we do is we introduce, uh, into the air caster, we introduce air, air flow uh, from outside, and it begins to fill this inner cavity of the air caster. As the air continues to fill this chamber, 
as you can see, the air caster begins to extend downward, coming in contact with the floor. And when it does so, it self seals against the floor. As that seal begins to happen and pressure builds, this air frame, these rest pads, begins to lift off the ground. So as the air begins to build pressure inside this unit, as you can see, the rest pads begin to leave the ground. Generally speaking, as we fill this chamber, uh, the air begins to leak into here. And what we're trying to achieve is about 36 PSI at the maximum rate of load for a given bearing. That's our normal operating condition. Now, we do make bearings that operate at higher loading conditions, 60, 65 PSI. Those are called high pressure bearings and they're for specialty applications. But most of our general air casters are rated to perform at 36 PSI. And this is critical because an air caster is designed to be a compliant device. And in a minute, we're gonna talk about different flooring conditions and why that compliance is important. If we were to put the PSI up higher, the, the air caster begins to get more rigid. And as it gets more rigid, it becomes less compliant. And as it becomes less compliant, it cannot handle different flooring conditions that are normal in factory settings. But back to our air skid. Here we go, building air. Uh, our, our frame begins to lift. The load begins to lift off the ground. We're approaching 36 PSI, and as we do so, we're starting to put a lot of pressure against the perimeter and the air is wanting to begin to escape from the perimeter. So as the air begins to fill this chamber and the pressure internally exceeds uh, the load weight, we actually begin to lose air outside of the seal and this creates what is known as air film, which is the lubrication required to float over a surface. While we're operating at about 36 PSI, generally our air film is only about four millimeters tall. And this is critical, again, uh, when we get into this compliancy discussion and talking about the different types of flooring conditions. Compliancy remains one of our, our greatest uh, assets in achieving proper uh, movement of a load. If you have an epoxy floor like the one we showed here in this training room, uh, it's a beautifully finished, very smooth surface. It's similar to the air hockey table type concept. Under that scenario, you can have a more rigid bearing and it will allow for compliancy because there's not much movement in the floor. If you were to take a microscope and blow up the flooring conditions, smooth epoxy might look very much like this or a machine finish surface like a, a milling center would put on something. It's very smooth and it has very little resistance to an air caster moving over it. That is considered an ideal situation. However, most of our customers have something that looks more like this, which is machine trowel finished concrete. Uh, if you were to blow that up, it would look like lots of ridges. And the key to machine trowel finished concrete's performance is the fact that the ridges are not very high. The best way to think about this is as a mountain range, or more importantly, in a mountain range, the valleys that you find in a mountain range. So as an air caster is trying to move over a surface like this, what's happening is in the valley itself, you're losing air film and you're losing airflow. And so the greater the valley, the more air film you lose. If you were to take epoxy and put sand grit in it and blow it up, it would look something like this. And you can imagine as this air caster is trying to float over the surface, not only is it dragging on the peaks, but one of the reasons it's dragging so hard is because the valley is so large that you're losing all of your air film, which is the lubrication it takes and requires it to have the frictionless type movement that we experience. This valley, the bigger it gets, the more air film to the point where you'll simply just stop and not be able to move. Uh, aged concrete with old pitted concrete, while it may have started out looking like this nice machine trial finished concrete, over time it gets more uh, aged, more pitting in it, it gets more valleys, which creates more drag. And drag is what begins to stop air bearings from having proper uh, air film movement and lubrication. Ideally, and what we base all of our designs around is machine trial finished concrete. Machine trial finished concrete is what's most uniformly found within factories and it's relatively easy to maintain. Where we have trouble with some of our competitors and lose opportunities is when people base all of their technology and all of their ratings on smooth epoxy. And what happens over time is the customer begins to get very frustrated because they're not able to maintain in a factory setting that smooth finish and if the bearing is operating its maximum capacity under the best flooring condition possible, you can see as that begins to degrade that you'll have nothing but problems and you'll begin to have more increasing valleys 
and more increasing air loss to the point where you simply cannot move in an effective manner. As we've discussed, uh, flooring surface is a critical function. Uh, machine trowel finished concrete is our you know, desired objective or epoxy finished floor. Um, one of the other things that does arise though uh, has to do with expansion joints and steps in the concrete. And while an air caster uh, designed by Airflow can handle a certain amount of uh, expansion joint um, width uh, it, and a certain amount of step, there is a limitation to it. Uh, example of what I'm talking about here is shown in this drawing where you have concrete where at an expansion joint a piece is heaved up and the step I'm referring to is this item right here. Now one of the things that helps us get across the step as you remember is we have a primary communication hole here but we also have what we refer to as sheet crossing holes. So as that air caster moves and impacts that step, what happens here is the air, it, it will start to def deform and you'll start to lose air film. Now you're still maintaining air film back here, but as the bearing progresses and gets on the other side of this unit further, at some point we have the sheet crossing hole is here and starts to put air lubrication on this side of the step and it allows it to continue to cross. However, as I said earlier, the larger the step, uh, the more problematic, and at a certain point, you'll be so disruptive to the air film that it will not be able to cross the step. The same thing applies to an expansion joint. The, if the expansion joint is relatively tight, a simple saw cut, generally our air casters are designed to transfer across that, and as the unit crosses over and gets on this side, we get the, commu the communication hole for the sheet crossing on this side of the expansion joint, it moves the air film lubrication to the other side, and you're fine. However, if this expansion joint were to get very large, it's possible that as we begin to cross this unit, we get so disruptive here that we lose so much air film out of the expansion joint that it simply cannot move any longer. One of the simple fixes for this is on an expansion joint is just fill it with simple epoxy. If you take simple epoxy, which they make expansion joint epoxy, you can fill it in and it'll cross the epoxy no problem. Um, that's what I recommend for uh, more permanent situations where you're running air casters continually. However, if you just have a limited move, a one-time move, it can be as simple as just taking a piece of tape and putting a piece of tape over the expansion joint and just simply floating across the piece of tape. Um, that's obviously not recommended for continual operation, but in limited moves, that's fine. Now related to the step, that's a little bit more difficult of a fix. There's a couple ways to attack that. Uh, the first one, when you have a step, would be to actually grind down the surface and create more of a uh, gentle slope that it starts to experience if you can bring a grinder in and, and reduce the step. However, if you're not able to reduce the step and you're having a problem getting your air caster uh, across that step, another simple fix would be to put a metal plate down over top of this, tape the sides down of the joint, and just use the metal thin gauge metal plate uh, as a transition point. Again, the more permanent though you're going to be, a uh, solution would be to grind it and try to bring it back to a flush state. That's better for ongoing operations, but for temporary moves, a simple plate of steel would be uh, able to, to transition a joint. Now that we've spent some time talking about basic air caster technology and learning about air skids, we're going to start talking about some additional applications that are common uh, for the use of air caster technology. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it's more common that you're using them in a system of three or four, four being the most common. This platform here is called a utility platform, and it has four individual air casters underneath it. Um, I think that this particular utility platform is rated for about 8,000 pounds that you can move on this. Uh, my lovely assistant, Paul, here is uh, not quite 8,000 pounds, but he'll at least show us a representation of how easy it is uh, to move a uh, product around. So this particular unit is very simple, has a on-off ball valve, has a, a dead man where you squeeze it to actuate the air, and if you let go, it acts as a safety circuit. It has a flow control valve, and this particular unit also has a guide wheel in the middle of it. And what we do with guide wheels is we actually have an air spring actuated against a wheel that actuates to the ground. And what that does is it prevents drifting. It allows us to move in more of a straight line and it gives us a point to pivot around for better steering control. You don't have to have it on. In fact, the valve here allows me to release it. And I'll show you an example of movement here in a minute with that. So basically, once you have your load on your platform, 
uh, all you do is hit the dead man and as you can see the air casters inflate and we can begin to move in a very simple movement and this is a free form movement right now the air uh, spring is not actuated against the guide wheel so we can move in this direction we can move sideways omnidirectional but as I put the uh, air spring on now it begins to limit my sideways movement and so I can't drift as easily side to side I can move linear because the guide wheel is in that direction but I cannot drift side to side as I have frictional force against the ground also with having the guide wheel down it gives me a nice pivot point to steer around which gives the operator better control relating to safety circuit the nice thing about our air casters they're designed unlike a lot of our competitors to actually be used as a brake if I'm moving along and I need to cut the unit, I simply cut the air and the unit immediately comes to a stop and a rest. Usually there's about three to four inches of travel uh, as the air is escaping, but relatively safe uh, stop occurs. After hitting a safety stop like we just did, the unit can reinflate and simply continue movement. Uh, an operator typically uses this to move uh, heavy loads of things that a fork truck or something may have dropped off to position it into their operator station. While initial acceleration does require a little bit more force, as well as, as deceleration, when an object is in motion, it requires about one pound of force per every thousand pounds to continue to drive it in motion. So as we've talked about our air skid application, a common setup is to have a framework with the unit sitting directly on the air skid with the air skid resting on the ground. Uh, this is a common rigging application. However, uh, sometimes people like to be able to move around on wheels when the unit does not have the heavy load sitting on their custom tooling or fixtures uh, as a person can just simply move it by hand without the airline connection uh, or pull it outside uh, in uh, adverse conditions where air casters are not able to be used. However, when you introduce the load and you want to move from wheels now onto the air caster technology, we've invented a device called the lift glide. And in the uh, non-operational state, it looks something like this, where the load is sitting with the wheel on the ground, and the lift glide is in a retracted uh, position where we use springs to actually pull it up off the ground so there's clearance. However, when you go to activate this unit, what happens is, is the air spring here in the middle, the unit inflates and actuates to the ground, like you see here, and as it begins to push down, then the wheel will actually begin to leave the ground uh, and, re and retract off the ground and now the unit is simply on the air skate. And then we activate the air caster which ad adds an additional three quarter inch of stroke in addition to the two and seven eighths inch stroke found in our lift glides which fully removes the wheel off the ground allowing the unit to now float on the air caster freely with no interference from the wheels. So this is our 12 inch lift glide air skid that you're looking at. Um, usually this unit is mounted to the customer's product off the ground we have <clears throat> bolt patterns here in the top plate where you would mount this, bolt this onto uh, whatever equipment you want to use. Uh, the posts here are our spring retraction units and this is our air skid underneath and the airbag that creates the actuation down to the ground. So again, normally this would be off the ground, spring retracted up in the air, and I'm just going to show you simply how the air spring movement uh, action works as well as the uh, air caster. So the first thing that you would do in this operation is you would actuate via the airbag this unit which would push the air uh, skid to the ground and as soon as the air skid contacts the wheels on the framework would come up off the ground and then the second thing you would do is actuate the air skid itself by bringing the air source and then the air bearing itself would raise up off the floor allowing for the omnidirectional flotation movement and then to set back down, you would simply reverse this. Again, you could use the air skid as a brake if need be. The unit rests steel on concrete, and then you'd uh, release the upper portion, and the springs, as the air would deplete from the system, would retract. Next, we're gonna talk about some of the common myths when it comes to selling air caster technology. Um, we typically get about five uh, common things that people talk about. Uh, first one is uh, people are concerned about the tornado effect. Is it going to blow air and debris everywhere? Stuff's going to be flying into people's eyes. Uh, and is it so loud that it's just going to terrorize our people in our factories? Uh, real quickly on those two, uh, you can hold a lit match next to an air caster and it won't blow it out. Um, uh, 
the, uh, the amount of air film that's escaping around the perimeter is, is very low. As it crosses a crack, you might see a little bit of uh, dust that will blow maybe an inch or two. In fact, the air caster can scoot uh, small debris out of its way just because of the air film, but it only blows it about an inch to two inches from the perimeter. Uh, relating to sound, you barely hear it. Um, uh, sometimes when you hit a certain spot, you might get a little bit of a squeal, but never exceeding 70 decibels, never creating problems for plant or OSHA regulations. Another common myth we get is, uh, is it gonna, the load gonna run away and kill somebody? Is it gonna free float off and it's uncontrollable? Uh, generally, this is why we put guide wheels in the systems and why we allow the dead man controller to uh, cut the air caster air to operate as a brake. Um, we've never had any industrial accidents with air caster technology. Simply by cutting the air, it comes to a stop. Uh, it is true that if you have an extremely sloped surface, it, it will follow uh, the natural path of gravity. Uh, generally, though, a guide wheel or a drive system that we have put on, this, on the uh, air caster technology uh, prevents that from happening. Not generally a concern as most companies have relatively flat floors. Uh, the next common myth that we run into is, uh, do I need a larger air compressor? Um, most companies have sufficient air compressor capacity to handle uh, the needs of our systems. Uh, people think that it requires massive amounts of pressure um, and usually uh, they don't even think about the CFM issue, but related to pressure we've already talked about, generally we're operating about 35 PSI. Uh, the ma matter of CFM though, I'm going to give you just a quick rule of thumb on how to deal with CFM calculation. Uh, 24 inch air caster handles about 12,500 pounds. If you take four of those in the systems, you got about a 50,000 pound capacity there. Um, that unit uses about 15 CFM, so you multiply that by four for a total system capacity of 60 CFM. Rule of thumb is 60 CFM divided by four equals 15. That also equates to how large a horsepower of a compressor you need to run that system. Now with a storage tank in line, uh, generally you can even run less than 15 horsepower to operate that system because it's pulling from the, the storage tank or pre-built up air. But if you're running directly off a uh, air compressor without any capacity storage whatsoever, you would need a 15 horsepower compressor to run four 24 inch air casters. Using this quick rule of thumb formula is a, is a very easy way to uh, size the compressor and understand if your uh, customer has uh, the industrial compressor capacity to handle the air caster solution you're selling. Um, last thought I wanna leave you with when you're selling air caster technology, don't even bother to sell air caster technology to people uh, who aren't willing to make a floor commitment. A lot of people think that they can have a poor floor and that this is a hovercraft and the way to solve that is just throw more air at it. Uh, but as we talked about earlier, the higher the pressure is in the bearing, the more air you're throwing at it. You, you've got a situation where the bearing is becoming more rigid. The more rigid it is, the less compliant it is and the less efficient your air film is. And by, simply by throwing air at something, it doesn't solve the problem. And so a lot of customers will tell you that they're gonna make a flooring commitment or that the floor is okay, uh, and they think they can just overcome it by dumping more air at it, and then they have problems. So make sure you have a flooring commitment from your customer up front. Uh, hopefully you find this video to be uh, educational and useful, and good luck selling uh, Airflow at Aircaster technology. And remember, not all Aircasters are created equal.